Good day folks and welcome to the Anorak Review Show with I, your host, the Anorak. And it's our 75th episode. Plus, with the recent Platinum Jubilee, I figured I'd try to make this one special this time round. As such, it's time once again to talk about Pink Floyd. I brought up the band before and have reviewed a few albums of theirs so far with Metal and Animals, two albums that some could see as the respective beginning and end of Pink Floyd's heyday. But today, we'll be discussing an album that came out soon after Metal, but before what would, might be known and well known as their successful album. But first, a little background history for context. After the release of Medal, Pink Floyd were already working on new material for what would become their next studio album, a piece for, ass for assorted lunatics. And have even decided to perform it live on tour as a whole, well over a year before the LP LP's eventual release, giving them a chance to tweak and adjust it into the classic, highly successful album we know today. However, by the beginning of 1972, Iranian Swiss director Babe Shaloda, I've probably butchered that surname again, had approached the band to have them produce a musical soundtrack for an upcoming feature film of his, after first having collaborated with them on his 1969 debut film, More. This film would be known as La Vallée, or The Valley in English, the story of a French consul's wife who ventures into the depths of New Guinea, meets a nice idea tribe, and ends up on a spiritual journey. Pink Floyd were given about six weeks to get the soundtrack propped up and ready for release, and with that side product done, dusted, and out the way, they got back to continuing work and touring for the main project. But that would be for another time though. As for now, we're covering the side project of theirs, this movie soundtrack that came about as a result, and just having turned 50 years old, it would eventually be known as Obscured by Clouds. Now, firstly I want to bear in mind, this copy I have is a very very old one, and it literally hasn't aged entirely well, with not exactly the best cardboard. I would have, I would have probably would have liked to buy like a later copy or a reissue, because I can't remember where I bought it, but it has definitely shown its age. But the cast for the cover itself, it's meh. It's a distorted image as out of focus of what turns out to be a man sitting in a tree. That seems to be about it. But like with most of the Floyd album covers, this one was done by the folks of Hypnosis, Storm Thorgerson and Aubrey Powell. Apparently they looked over a bunch of stills from the film on a, on a 35mm projector, possibly hoping to find a good potential shot for the cover, much like with more. However, when the slide they, they were using had jammed at one point, it ended up creating this visual effect that they came to like. The band themselves didn't want the cover to look all that good, or even now all that great, concerned that it would overshadow their next album, but Storm himself insisted that it still be given just as much proper consideration like any other Floyd album. So like with Metal, we have a, have a little surreal compromise here, which might as well sum up the album itself for many people really. I haven't had a chance to actually see the whole of the Valley film beyond a few clips and trailers on YouTube, so I don't know if there are any differences between the mu the music in this album or how it may be in the movie. So as such, I'm going to judge this as an album on its own right, on its own merit, and less how it may compare and co or even connect to said film. Sometimes a good or even a great film score or soundtrack is one that can stand on its own just as well as it can fit the film it was made for. So, and with that, let's actually judge the music for itself, shall we? We begin the album with its title track, 
Obscured by Clouds, a three-minute instrumental track co-written by bassist Roger Waters and guitarist David Gilmore, consisting of a low, long, droning VCS3 synthesizer that Richard Wright had purchased from BBC's Radiophonic Workshop and would use for, for a good chunk of this album and later Floyd albums, as well as a steady, consistent beat from drummer Nick Mason, utilizing electronic drums, and David playing his sweet guitar as almost always, in order to keep the song from sounding too monotonous. It starts off by fading in, giving its listeners a good chance to be eased into the music itself, and Gilmore's guitar almost sounds like it's taking the substitute role for lead vocals, as if it's doing the singing instead. And as soon as it ends, it, be, it kind of soon ends as soon as it begins. Not too short, not dragging for too long, it just comes and goes at the right time. Plus, even if you didn't know this was or is from a film and soundtrack, one could easily imagine this being played as part of a movie score, especially one made today with hybrid music. Next is another instrumental piece, When You're In, which begins perfectly from the first track, having a sort of companionship with each other, especially since they were played live in several concerts back to back together at the time. Above Nick's classic, authentic sounding proggy drum rolls, David, David's guitars and Rick's organs really come to form this raw jamming harmony. And at two and a half minutes in, this too knows when to come and go as it too slowly fades back out again. Some may feel it and the song before it may understay their welcome, but bear in mind, much like with more, the band had to do a soundtrack to a film, which they had only seen a rough cut of at that point. And they were already developing their their big studio album, I'm sure many of you can guess what it may be, so they weren't too concerned about whether or not the songs here would be big, complex, or even structured as well as with other Floyd albums. Plus, they were hurried and pressured to get enough material produced and done as soon as possible. Another thing to note about this is that it's also one of two songs in this album to have all four members credited in writing it. So, make of that if you will. Or if you may. Then there are Burning Bridges, the first song of Obscured by Clouds to feature actual lyrics and vocals. Rick plays a predominant Hammond organ in this music that he mostly composed, while singing the Roger Penn lyrics as a duet with David, who plays a bit of sly guitar, like with Adam Hart Mother and One of These Days. The calm nature of the song does remind me a bit of A Pillow of Winds from Metal. Said lyrics here are quite poetic and enig enigmatic, as far as Roger Waters' lyrics go. Bridges burning and merging with shadows, and stalling moments floating in the air with wings of fire. Seems those stalling moments drag a bit of Red Bull and petrol. Caution, don't ever actually try that. The burning of a bridge is a common saying, which can mean committing oneself to an irreversible decision, or even cutting off ties with another group or individual, especially in favour of another, which could be a foreshadow to the themes of social isolation and alienation in the, in the album Pink Floyd would eventually make seven years later, The Wall. Again, very likely a coincidence, but seeing how Roger Waters wrote these lyrics, it's likely he had something of a similar mindset here. And like I said, I haven't seen La Vallée, so I don't know if the lyrics here have any additional meaning connected to the film or not. If Roger did indeed intend so. After that is the gold, it's in the dot dot dot. That's literally the title right there. David co-wrote this with Roger and does the whole vocals himself here. It's also where he really gets to show off his hard rocking blues influence with some strumming guitars and 
and also a bit of a solo here and there. More at home in an album by Jimi Hendrix or Led Zeppelin. I'd compare it to the Nile song from the More, Al More soundtrack. Although not as heavy or trippy, David sings about a seemingly need for someone to share in his travels and adventures with, while everyone else are in it for the either figurative or literal gold, he's looking for the thrills. Thrills as in the thrill of adventure? Or the thrill of getting a piece of amagama? I mean, it was the early 70s and all. Although, given the whole journey motif of this song, over the mountains and across the seas, it is likely connected to the film's own similar journey of self-discovery in a partially mountainous island. Another thing to note about this track is that the whole set of lyrics are sung up to the 1 minute and 15 second mark, two-fifths into the song itself. That means the rest of it is essentially a prolonged guitar solo. Not that I'd be complaining about it one bit, it's still David freaking Gilmore showing off his musical prowess as almost always. A bit like a prototype to have a cigar from Wish You Were Here. Following that is What's dot 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 uh the deal. Seriously, don't you just love these names? This is another Waters Gilmore piece where Gilmore sings the Waters Append lyrics. This one being a five minute acoustic folk ballad about taking advantages and opportunities in life and the long term effects that may come of them. One line that comes to my mind is, turn my lead to gold, which may be a reference to not only the golden touch of King Midas, but also taking something as raw and neurotoxic as lead and in converting it into something safer and more desirable, like gold. There may also be a connection to the previous song title, of course, especially since both have the same songwriters. And speaking of titles, this title, the line of Flash the Reedies and When You're In's title, were supposedly phrases set spoken by one of the band's roadies, Chris Adamson. They must really like that guy. Halfway through the song, we also get a little bit of a, of a piano solo from Richard, which gives a bit of the bit of a soft jazzy edge to it, alongside Dava's lap steel guitar solo that immediately follows after. It does feel more like a David Gilmore song than a Roger Waters song, and I guess the man himself would think so too, as he would perform it live on occasion in his concerts in support of his 2006 comeback solo album, On an Island. Side 1 ends with Mud Man. Lasting for about 4 minutes and 20 seconds. Yeah, I see what you did there. <laughs> this track is likely named after the Asado Mud Men that appear in the film itself. And from the few clips and images I could find online, Let's just say they're not exactly something you like to see surrounding you in a jungle or rainforest. As for the song itself, it's another instrumental piece, this one pretty much being a reprise of Burning Bridges, not only letting the breezy piano and organ of Richard Wright shine through more, but also the distinct dreamy guitar of David Gilmore as well. The more I listen to it, the more spiritual I somehow feel just from hearing those band members just play out their hearts as much as possible. It's honestly a very good way to close out the first half of the album.